Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you like this episode, please remember to hit the like button and leave a comment or two. Then subscribe and click on the bell to receive notifications of whenever we release new videos. Also, please remember to share them to your social media. Today's episode takes us to the Arctic north of Canada, to the area called Nunavut. The landmass surrounds the Hudson Bay and the tops of the hills are rounded off due to millennia of glacial erosion. The plant life consists of low brush and shrubs with seasonal flowers. The animal life includes walrus, seals, arctic fox, geese, caribou, wolves, and polar bears. Nunavut hunters Leo Ijengiak, 38 years of age, Laurent Jr. Utak, and Daryl Konak, 33 years of age, decided to go caribou and narwhal hunting at their usual hunting site and left Neyajot with its population of 1,080 souls on Tuesday, August 21, 2018, full of excitement and optimism. The trio motored along the beautiful Hudson Bay coast for 70 kilometers and were approaching Lion Bay, their hunting destination of choice. They were born and raised here and knew the country better than the back of their own hands, so they didn't bring a GPS. Their boat motor had been running poorly and they thought they would hunt while it cooled. The hunters piloted their way into the bay and beached their boat to start looking for caribou. The men glassed the area and hiked a short distance in search of a caribou herd, but after a few hours returned to their boat. While the men were hunting, a huge patch of sea ice had floated over the mouth of Lion Bay, making their exit dangerous, if not impossible. They knew there was nothing they could do until the sea ice passed by, so they pitched their tent and made camp. As the men tinkered on the boat motor for a couple of days, they unknowingly began to gather an ominous crowd. By the morning of Thursday, August 23rd, the men had been there two days and were hoping for rescue as repair had failed. They couldn't raise anyone on the CB radio in the boat, so they would just have to wait. They were making morning tea in front of their tent when they noticed some uninvited guests. The men noticed a polar bear walking toward them, so Leo grabbed his hunting rifle from inside the tent. He fired it into the air to frighten the bears off. The bears were very close before they were noticed and the scene quickly fell into chaos. Laurent had exited the tent right behind Leo and in the confusion was grabbed by the female polar bear. She pulled him close and clamped her jaws onto his head. It was at that point that Daryl became so frightened he committed the one mistake he shouldn't. He began to run away. The female polar bear immediately dropped Laurent and began to pursue Daryl. Leo fired his rifle, trying to kill the bear before it could reach his friend, but his rifle jammed. He ran into the tent and grabbed a different rifle and named it at the polar bear. Needless to say, she quickly caught Daryl and knocked him to the ground. She began clawing and biting him about the head and neck. She mauled him mercilessly before she was shot and killed by Leo. He also shot her yearling cub. Leo and Laurent ran to their friend's side and tried to patch his wounds and stop his bleeding, but they could do nothing for their friend. He was essentially dead before they tried to save him, but their devotion for their friend led them to try to save him anyway. They realized the futility of their first aid and covered their friend with a tarp. Leo and Laurent were also injured. Laurent had a bite wound on his head, but appeared to be none the worse aware aside from that. The men were surrounded by the carnage of the incident, with two dead bears laying near their dead friend. They now understood how precarious their sleeping situation was and moved their improvised shelter to the cab of their beached boat along with Daryl's corpse. By the 24th of August, other bears in the area began looking the camp over. It was apparently quite a draw for them. The boat stood out on the shore, and the smell of blood from the dead polar bears and Daryl probably raised their curiosity. One of the distant polar bears began approaching the attack scene. Leo and Laurent were warned thin and intolerant of any bears by the fifth day of their ordeal. Leo shot the bear and killed it, stating that he will take responsibility for any legal repercussions from the act. Another day later, still stranded, the men were approached by a fourth polar bear. This bear also met the same fate as the others. He was shot by Leo while guarding his friend's life and his dead friend's corpse. The men would watch as the ghost-like shapes of the polar bears in the distance would appear and then disappear to reappear somewhere else. The polar bears continued to test the camp boundaries day and night. Leo and Laurent had to stay vigilant to keep the bears at bay. The anxiety of the situation helped them stay awake for three days while warding the polar bears from them and Daryl's remains. By Friday, August 24th, their families had become alarmed that the men hadn't yet returned. 
They called the authorities, and rescue planes began searching on Saturday, August 25th, by air, as ground search crews scoured the land. A boat of ground searchers were piloted to Lion Bay, but were blocked from entering due to the sea ice. The icebreaker CCGS Louis St. Laurent was recruited in the search for the hunters, and the search helicopter was dispatched from it to comb the ground. The pilot flew the craft into Lion Bay and located the stranded hunters, now exhausted. It took three men to load Daryl's body into the helicopter, and the villagers mourned his loss when the men returned to their town. Wildlife officials investigated the dead polar bears and determined that one was a mature female and the mother of the yearling male, and the third was a younger solitary female bear. The fourth bear that was shot and presumed dead had either recovered and left or was dragged away for consumption by other polar bears. All of the bears involved in the attack were said to be in fair to good shape. The residents of Neajot are said to be on edge with the tensions from Daryl's death. Some residents even stated that they planned to shoot polar bears on site, citing the difference in harvest permits with nearby towns. Neajot was only allotted 10 permits for polar bears, while nearby towns were allocated nearly 40. Given the strict regulations surrounding harvest, protection, and prosecution for violators, natives are put in a ridiculous position. This was the second polar bear attack in Nunavut in 2018, and authorities and natives are still searching for an acceptable solution to balance the needs of polar bears and people. <laughs> Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to Arviat, Nunavut Island, to a place called Century Island in Hudson Bay in northeast Canada. This windswept land of rock and ice is, is a nearly inhospitable place, but indigenous people have scraped out a living here for untold eons. When the ice melts in the summer, the natives can fish, but in the brutal winters, ice covers the water and land, and the humans frequently come face to face with the world's largest bear species in competition for a common food source, seals. The polar bear is renowned as being one of the few bear species who stalks human beings and considers them as part of the ecosystem. There are no trees to climb here. The only avenues for escape are the open seas or to run across the open ground. Polar bear can run 35 miles per hour and swim for days on end, so neither of those options is viable. That leaves only yourself as a means of self-defense, escape, or protection. Aaron Gibbons was a 31-year-old father of one son and three daughters and a member of the Inuit community. He was known for being a great hunter and providing meat for needy members of the community as well as being a dedicated family man. His friends would describe him as having never lost his temper, which is quite a feat with four young children. On July 3, 2018, Aaron loaded up his four children and his 22 long rifle firearm into his boat. The group planned to go to Sentry Island to harvest bird eggs and have a fun family. They departed Arviat, their 2,500-person community, and motored the 10 miles to the island. Aaron's children, who are elementary school aged, piled off the boat and immediately started playing and running around. They were carefree, with no stress in their lives, as the warmth of the summer energized them as it does to young people. Their dad secured the boat on the rocky shore and began making his way toward the kids. Aaron instructed the kids on what to look for when gathering the eggs and how to avoid having any problems with defensive bird parents and turned the vivacious kids loose. They ran around finding and seeking their seasonal delicacy as if Mother Nature sponsored an Easter egg hunt a few months too late. As the children amassed a growing collection of bird eggs, Aaron's mind slipped into a bit of mental recess and reflection for a moment. He hastily snapped out of it when he sees a huge white mass stealthily moving in the direction of his kids. At this time of year, most polar bears are essentially doing what their brown bear cousins do in the winter, a sort of summer hibernation. They don't find a den or bury themselves, but they do lay around and wait for cooler temperatures to prevail while living off the body fat they've amassed over the winter hunting season. The only polar bears that do not do this are the desperate, starving ones. As the large white mass slowly morphs into what Aaron recognizes as a polar bear, Aaron knows he will have to intervene. This bear is not playing. It's not just curious. It is sneaking up on his daughter while she plays and gathers eggs. Aaron heeds the demeanor of the polar bear. Its head is down and ears are back. It's moving slowly and watching the children as they dart from nest to nest. It carefully examines its most hidden approach avenues and slowly closes the distance between the children and himself. 
Aaron knows this is a dire situation and immediately puts a plan of action into place. He orders the kids to run to the boat immediately as he runs toward them and gathers rocks. His 22 long rifle firearm is in the boat and that's in the other direction, so Aaron utilizes the weapons he has on hand, baseball sized stones. As the kids run toward the safety of the boat, the polar bear starts to quickly close the distance between them. Aaron intercepts their path and lobs the rocks at the bear and yells in an attempt to scare it off. The rocks pelt the side of the bear, which stops and looks it all over for a few seconds. The bear is in bad shape and hungry. It cannot be frightened away from a needed opportunity to feed and starts to focus on Aaron. Aaron is a very experienced hunter and knows that this is not a fake or a bluff. This bear is coming to kill and eat him. When Aaron sees that the bear will not be run off, he instructs his eldest daughter to call for help on the radio. She immediately does exactly what her daddy instructs her to do. Then she watches, along with her brothers and sisters. As the polar bear begins to move toward Aaron, the man thinks twice about the standoff and breaks form. He starts to run for the boat. If he can get it launched quickly and motor out as fast as he can, he can keep his kids and himself safe. But events do not transpire that way. The polar bear runs Aaron down in just a few yards and tackles him to the ground as he runs toward his children. The kids can do nothing but look as their daddy is mauled before their eyes. The polar bear grabs Aaron around the neck and throws him back and forth and up and down. Aaron's body quickly goes limp as the bear continues to throw him back and forth and beat his body on the rocks. The brave little girl's radio signal is successful. Authorities respond and dispatch the aggressive and underweight young male polar bear. His community stood on the beach as Aaron's body was brought back to town. The attack and the lead up to it was obviously a predatory situation, but why? An elder at Arviat, Bobby Suluk, was re reported as saying that when he moved there 60 years ago, they would sleep out under the stars in a tent and never even consider a polar bear attack. Today, Inuit and visitors alike must fear polar bear attacks no matter their activity. Some community members blame ecotourism, as excursions allow tourists to walk alongside the polar bears, but strictly forbid feeding them. In the time frame between 1870 and 2014, there were a mere 20 human fatalities. If you've seen our Scary Animal Attacks channel and watched our episode on leopard seals, then you will know the frequency of contacts with people has something to do with that, but there is more to it. Last year, in Arviat, there were over 300 polar bear sightings. The bears are possibly losing their fear of people. The situation is exacerbated when the government of Canada limits the quota that indigenous people like the Inuit can harvest. The limit currently is only eight bears, and the Inuit hunters meet it in only three days, which tells you that they are finding plenty of bears in their area. Otherwise, community members are allowed to shoot a polar bear when it threatens their lives, which sounds like a bad position to be put in. Scientists say that polar bear populations have decreased 20% in recent years despite an increase in sightings. They cite that the bears now have less ice to hunt on due to climate change, and this is creating a change in their behavior. The Canadian government estimates that there are 14,000 polar bears in Nunavut territory. Aaron was one of two men killed in 2018 in Nunavut. Inuit leaders have petitioned the Canadian government to allow them to harvest more polar bears to ensure community safety. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. This episode is called, This Bear Wanted to Kill His Food. In the vast Canadian North Country, the natives live in close relationship with their environment. Their day-to-day -day activities revolve around basic substance. They rely primarily and frequently on native and local sources of food, including seals, whales, walruses, and occasionally polar bears. Tok was a member of the First Nations people in the northern Arctic regions of the Canadian North. He and his cousin Nat were planning their typical seal hunting trip, which consisted of a few days crossing ice flows and expansive Arctic ice capes in search of favorable places to catch and kill seals. They really had no way to predict what type or species of seal they would find and basically had to accept whatever came their way. Relying on their wit, experience, and resourcefulness to get them out of any bind that may arise. After rounding up their firearms and other needed equipment, Tok and Nat loaded up their snowmobiles for their trip. In recent decades, the indigenous people had given in to the easier and more comfortable amenities of modern life. 
while still clinging to their way of life and whatever cultural remnants they could. Indigenous people of the north of prior generations utilized sled dogs, atlatls, spears, and whale ivory hooks to catch and kill much of their food. But today's indigenous people frequently trade the old methods for modern ones and unfortunately lose their own cultural uniqueness in the exchange. The loud engines wind up as the young men pull away from their village and they line out single file for the 47 mile trip to their favorite seal hunting ground. The spring snow was turning into slush during the daytime but would freeze hard at night and allow the seal hunters to cross muddy or boggy areas easily on their snow machines. As the comfort of their village fades away, they are filled with a sense of adventure and freedom that only wilderness can bring. Living this close to the land does have its rewards and its perils. The young hunters traveled the 47 mile distance with within an hour or so and arrived at the edge of the land and the expanse of the sea opened up. Although it was still frozen, it was the only place that they would find the seals they were hunting as the seals do not go inland far enough to be hunted. The men hiked along the edge of the ice flows covering the sea in search of a seal breathing hole. This is a hole in the ice that seals use to emerge from the icy waters to breathe or rest. At times, they will swim up through the hole and climb out onto the sea ice to lay in the scarce sunlight or sleep or have their babies. After some searching, the men found what they were looking for. There was a hole in the ice about 18 inches across that had obvious signs of being used by seals. The experienced subsistence hunters also knew that the seals would have these holes about every quarter mile or so apart so Nat planned to move on and find another breathing hole to hunt over. Before he departed, he would help Talk set up his hunting position. The two men positioned a snow blind next to the hole so that the seals would not see Talk as they emerged, and Nat began his trek to find a second breathing hole. Hunting seals in this manner required a tremendous amount of patience. The seals could choose a breathing hole at random, and waiting motionless for hours hoping they would choose this particular breathing hole was a calculated risk. In the old days the indigenous people would use atlatls or spears to harvest the animal but today the men were using small caliber rifles. As Tok gazed into the frigid sea water filling the breathing hole his mind wandered to various other things he could be doing. He thought of his chores and repairs on his house he needs to complete while waiting for the sea water in the breathing hole to stir, signaling an approaching seal. Hours passed and the patient ice hunter barely moved from his initial position to avoid giving himself away. Tok's eyes stared blankly at the breathing hole as he had held his rifle aimed at the hole ready for a seal to appear at any minute. Suddenly he heard a noise to his right and behind him. Slowly he turned his head and he saw the immense shape of a giant male polar bear only four feet from him. The stealthy arctic assassin had padded up on the hunter without being noticed and now was dangerously close. Tok's mind started to race as adrenaline flooded his body. He knew he would not want to make any sudden movements or run away as that would trigger the polar bear's predatory instincts, and he would be done in no time. Tok's knees began to shake uncontrollably, and he fought the instinct to run. As the polar bear looked him up and down, calculating exactly what he should do, Tok began to feel overwhelmed and started to accept his apparent fate. He realized the bear was too close for him to spin around and shoot at and he crumbled to the ground in acceptance of his fate. He lay still and held his breath in terror, devoid of any reasonable alternative. With his eyes closed, Tok could hear the massive bear slowly walk up beside him and could hear his giant breath of the sea ice predator. He suddenly felt the cold rubbery nose of the polar bear on his cheek as the bear examined him for life. The bear sniffed Tok up and down, looking for signs of life, 
His breathing, his breath smelled like a combination of fish and putrefaction. And Tox struggled to control his fear and move or try to get away. After slobbering all over Tox's face while sniffing him, the bear sniffed the ground like a giant hound dog. He slowly wandered off as he followed Nat's tracks in the snow. As soon as the bear was a few yards away, Tok opened his eyes and cautiously watched the bear disappear from sight. Tok sat up and had a hard time regaining his feet due to the adrenaline dump from the experience. He knew that he did not want to follow the bear and chose instead to run all the way back to his snowmobile. He covered the return trip in record time and roused the men of the village to return to find his friend. As the search party arrived at Tok's hunting site, they could see the bear's giant tracks in the snow as he followed Nats. The men kept a wary eye out for the bear and followed, hoping to find him before he could cause any danger or damage. Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider clicking on the like button and clicking on the bell icon. We'll help you know when we post our new episodes. Posting our video links to your social media profiles furthers awareness, and it's fun. We slashed our prices in our merch store, linked below. So check out the bargains there while you shop. As a member of our human community, remember to adventure bravely and be careful out there, especially in bear country.